should be interesting. Colin's been with the Zephyr program since 2019. So I guess in a way that makes you a bit of a new boy, but three years? Yeah, two years. Uh, has worked in flight operations and the engineering disciplines. He's responsible for the avionics on board uh, Zephyr and has worked on the flight test instrumentation system. He has, uh, this is an interesting one because I'm not quite sure how you do this. Do you have 88 <laughs> hours of Zephyr flight time log? So you don't actually sit on it. So I assume that's being the pilot in charge on the ground, but I'm sure you can tell us more about that uh, later on. Uh, I was part of the crew that flew Zephyr into controlled airspace. Uh, prior to Zephyr, Colin worked for TALIS, Megit and Airbus Defence Systems, and as an MSc in unmanned aircraft systems and design from the University of Southampton. Uh, outside Zephyr, he's uh, a committed member of the uh, Solent branch, which is where I got the information from and why it's with us tonight, uh, and a member of the Goodwood uh, Aero Club. Uh, this is a short video <laughs> about uh, the Auto Company. I'll use Mepix now. In the future, we'll see things clearly. Everything will be aware of the problem with the human. We'll find solutions faster. We'll see greater opportunities. And we'll see them. On the level of connectivity programming. 5G. We know this because the stratospheric age has already begun. Airborne, flying at 70,000 feet for days, weeks, months at a time, powered only by the sun, leaving nothing behind as the whisper. The Alpha is at my higher altitude platform station. He's up to eyes on our planet. There's an instant possibility for an empire. What we see in the future will be limited only by imagination. The safer, happier, and wealthier world. Else might be. In the stratosphere, there's no limit. Not all Zephyr, the future is I'll pick up from the, the, the back of the um, uh, the video there. So um, we are Alto. We are a, a telecommunications company. So whereas before Airbus were um, a, an airframe company, an aircraft company, uh, operating the Zephyr. Um, we are now Alto. We are providing telecommun telecommunication services and the Zephyr is the aircraft we're using to do it. So this is the aircraft itself. Um, so the, uh, the surprising stats about this aircraft are the size and weight. So a 25 meter wingspan but only 75 kilos. So that is less than the weight of me, uh, but with uh, a, a huge wingspan, which is larger than most um, light aircraft. Um, it's designed to be flown in the stratosphere. Everything about it is optimized for flight in the stratosphere. So the airfoil of the wings, the propellers uh, and the control surfaces, um, and it uh, is uh, um, actually slightly compromised when it's flying in lower altitudes. We've achieved a great deal with this. We've uh, achieved multiple world records over the years with the various versions of Zephyr. And the most recent long flight we made, which was last year in 2022, was over 64 days of continuous day and night flying. It's unfortunately not a, an official record because Unfortunately, we didn't uh, land it properly, uh, but uh, yeah, I'll come on to that <laughs> in a minute. So why is it called Zephyr? So a bit of history. Uh, it was named after, not the uh, Ford Zephyr, uh, it was named after um, a uh, an aircraft which was made here at Farnborough um, in 1922. Uh, so the 
the name Zephyr allows that uh, history to, uh, to to reach back uh, to the early days of aviation. We're not the first solar electric aircraft. Um, so NASA um, flew um, solar electric aircraft uh, back in the 70s. Uh, and as you see from the pictures there, some of them were hybrid of human powered flight and solar powered flight. Um, we do have uh, amongst our Zephyr engineers some uh, aficionados of human powered flight. I don't quite think I've got the power to weight ratio to uh, join that team, but uh, it's um, a very similar discipline because we're trying to uh, uh, fly something which is incredibly light. And now onto some of the more famous solar powered aircraft. Again, these are um, manned aircraft, so uh, the um, the, the 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 Pathfinder, the Centurion, and uh, Solar Impulse uh, are the ones which we uh, are more used to seeing in the news and uh, setting records. Um, but the Solar Impulse um, uh, making the first man's 24-hour flight. So how did we get to this incredible machine? So um, there are quite a few folks here uh, who work for Kinetic <laughs> or have worked for Kinetic. So uh, I'm sure you'd be happy to see the logo on the screen. The Zephyr aircraft uh, actually started life as an idea um, for a photo opportunity. So the, the Kinetic project at the time was to actually um, have a stratospheric balloon um, but the marketing department realised that there wouldn't be any opportunity to take any pictures of it because if this thing's in the stratosphere, no other aircraft can get up to the stratosphere to, to, to take a picture. So the idea was to have a small tethered aircraft off the bottom of the balloon uh, to be able to fly round and round on a, on a string, taking photos of this balloon for marketing purposes. Uh, and it quickly developed into an aircraft in its own right. So there were the first versions of Zephyr were, were developments of this, and unfortunately the first, uh, so the third Zephyr didn't fly because the uh, balloon actually crashed on launch. So uh, in 2004, the team won the design funding to make uh, Zephyr 4. So as you'll see in these pictures, each Zephyr has got a different variation. The very first Zephyrs look very simple uh, and with each model revision there's more detail, there's more uh, there's more um, features on the uh, aircraft aircraft structure <clears throat> and uh, the capabilities of the aircraft are, 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 are greater. Uh, we'll see a video shortly of the launch mechanism that we, was used for Zephyr 4. So your eyes aren't deceiving you, that's a Zephyr aircraft being tipped onto its wingtip with the other wingtip secured to a balloon. So in this launch configuration, the aircraft was brought up to altitude very slowly with um, the, the balloon rising. It's quite an elegant way to launch, but it's quite imprecise. <laughs> it's it's uh it's it's not very precise i don't know if it was uh, this particular launch but um this method of launch uh, did have a particular flaw whereby when the aircraft was released from the balloon um there was a one, at least one instance where it was 50 50 as to whether or not the aircraft would fly upright or upside down unfortunately it flew upside down made it along for a fair distance, but unfortunately the control services uh, and the control computer couldn't quite understand how to control the aircraft when it was upside down and it, uh, it unfortunately crashed. But uh, the project was uh, able to continue and we were able to build a, a new and uh, improved uh, versions of the Zephyr. So again, this was 
still back in the kinetic days when um, the team there were working almost like a skunk works. Um, so it was a small project, almost like a sort of hobbyist project. Most of the folks that you see in the uh, in the picture there were working elsewhere in the space uh, division of kinetic and were brought onto this uh, uh, crazy Zephyr project uh, almost uh, as a hobby and a, a kind of a, a side project, but it began to take on a life of its own. Um, the chap who's in the middle there uh, is Chris Kelleher. He's um, one of the, or he is the father of Zephyr in many ways. Um, uh, the uh, um, long serving um, staff members from Kinetic who were, were there in the very early days of Zephyr. So uh, for, for me and my team working today, we're, we're very much standing on the shoulders of the giants who uh, who made the, uh, the Zephyrs in the early generations. Zephyr 6 starting to look like a little bit more like a, a mature aircraft now. Uh, it's looking in terms of its geometry, uh, quite like the, uh, the the Zephyr that we have today, and as you can see from the picture in the uh, of the ground station, uh, it's a little bit more developed than the um, than the the, the, the previous uh, ground station. This is a uh, bespoke ground station with bes bespoke software, and we're still using a, a version of that software in our Zephyr today. <clears throat> Now, this is how we launch today, which is a bit more elegant than just uh, lifting it up on a wingtip. The surprising thing is how slow the aircraft is when it's able to launch. And so as you saw from that video, the, the folks who are launching it didn't really get above, <coughs> excuse me, above more than a jogging speed. And that is the forward airspeed of the Zephyr when it's flying. launch site there is um, the Yuma Proving Ground in Arizona. So we launch these aircraft in desert conditions typically because not only for the, the, the latitude but for also for the, the weather windows which we need to get up to the stratosphere. Uh, it takes about 18 hours to get up to uh, up to 60,000 feet. So yeah, the, the actual instantaneous rate of climb is very dependent on the um, or how hard we're pushing it in the uh, the, the, uh, the the local conditions. So you can appreciate it's a lot less manoeuvrable than a manned aircraft. Uh, so bringing it into land, uh, we don't have the same opportunity to uh, line up on the runway. It's uh, a very skilled task.
So the the feature of Zephyr is is endurance. So this is the altitude profile of uh, the Z7. So uh, the first thing to see is that we've got 14 days of flight there. The, the aircraft will typically charge its batteries and climb during the day and then glide and descend during the night. So that's why you see these um, peaky altitude profiles. So um, this was an achievement. This is a continuous 14 days flight. Um, but you can see that there's some very wide variations in altitude. Um, now, although we were able to achieve stratospheric flight, we were entering the stratosphere, we were then having to come back down below the stratosphere uh, during the uh, night. Um, and as we'll see in the later slides, that's, uh, that's bad news for a Zephyr because that's where all the weather is. Our aim is to continually stay in the stratosphere. But for the uh, achievement at the time, <clears throat> uh, that was uh, that, that was achieved by uh, uh, Zephyr 7. Excuse me. <clears throat> so it was at that time that Kinetic um, sold the project to Airbus. And the Zephyr 8 was developed. And there's another short video. This video from our uh, engineering flight bar that we conducted in 2018 with the Zephyr 8. And so you saw uh, pictures there of the aircraft being assembled and put together in the hangar. And also the method of taxiing, we do call it taxiing, which is where the uh, aircraft is pushed out on a, on a frame. Um, you saw some clips there from our optical payload, uh, which is able to linger uh, over a target and see uh, vehicles uh, moving, which um, is something that a satellite can't do because it is continually passing over. So these, these are the summary stats for Zephyr 8. And Zephyr 8 is the uh, model of Zephyr that we're flying at the moment. So um, as I mentioned, it, uh, it is designed to cruise in the stratosphere. It still uh, weighs only 75 kilos, sports up to five times its own weight. The way that the uh, Zephyr wing is designed and constructed is span loaded. So uh, in contrast to uh, an airliner where all of the mass uh, that the wings are carrying are, is, is concentrated in the, in the fuselage, um, if you imagine a, uh, a wing test for uh, uh, an, an airliner, if you've seen those videos where they bend the wing tip up uh, to, to test um, the, the loading of the wing, the Zephyr, um, the mass is actually distributed along the wing. So we don't have a, a big heavy fuselage in the center. Um, the, the, the mass and the lift are distributed along the wing. And it's more like, um, if you if you can imagine a lilo floating on a swimming pool, that's more like the structure of the wing. If you if you put a huge mass in the in the center of that lilo, it's going to fold in half. Uh, but if you put lots of smaller masses along that lilo, then um, it will um, maintain its structure. And it's similar for the Zephyr. Uh, and so we have to use a, a different um, way of uh, testing the mechanical integrity of the wing. So the 75,000 foot maximum operational altitude is the uh, official maximum. Uh, but what we're really trying to do is to operate above 
flight level 600. So there's two reasons why that's important to us. Firstly, it's in the stratosphere where we're avoiding all the weather, um, but also uh, for, for airspace. So uh, for manned air traffic, typically that airspace is reserved up to uh, 60,000 feet. So flight level 600. Um, most aircraft, most manned aircraft don't get that high anyway. So typically uh, an airline is, will be sort of 36, 40,000 feet. Uh, there might be a few business jets getting up to maybe 50, 55,000 feet. Um, but above that, air traffic controllers don't really care what we do. It's um, it's uh, called the um, the upper E airspace. Um, and the manned air traffic controllers don't really have the technology to um, to, to to monitor the traffic in that area anyway. So um, that's why Amongst the stratospheric operators, we've uh, got uh, an alliance between our companies, which uh, although we are on paper competitors, we're all trying to use the stratosphere uh, in a pioneering way. Uh, we're all trying to um, uh, um, all trying to convince the same certification authorities that uh, it's safe uh, to do what we're doing. So um, that flight level 600 is important to us because if we come below it, then we're in man airspace and uh, the, the game changes. This is a, a model of the atmosphere. Uh, so you can just about see there's a, a model of a Zephyr there. Um, so if we start down at the surface, um, as we get higher, the temperature reduces. So uh, when you climb up to the top of Mount Everest, it's cold. But then uh, in, as you pass through the tropopause from between the troposphere and the stratosphere, um, the temperature actually inverts. So um, the uh, as you climb higher, it starts to get a bit warmer again. So uh, we have uh, a uh, hockey stick um, temperature altitude profile. The troposphere on that diagram uh, is also to show that that's where, where all the weather is. So um, when you see a thunderstorm appearing with that big anvil uh, shape at the top, uh, that's because it's hit the um, the tropopause and it's and it's spreading out. There, there's there is sometimes a part of that thunderstorm which can punch through into the stratosphere, but generally that's uh, where the, uh, the 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 weather will stay below the, um, the tropopause. This a um, a demonstration of uh, where we are able to operate. So. Um, Quite obviously, we need the sun to, to fly. We, it's favourable for us to fly uh, in the uh, the summer of whichever hemisphere we're trying to operate. So um, that obviously means we get longer days uh, and shorter nights, um, but also it, it means that we um, we well, we are um, uh, able to to uh, position where it's best favourable for the um, the time of year. So. In the northern, northern hemisphere summer, we're able to fly at those higher latitudes and in the southern hemisphere summer, we follow the sun down to the lower uh, latitudes. Now, depending on the aircraft fit and the payload and the mission type, we're able to uh, um, go slightly higher or lower, lower than those latitudes, depending on um, yes, how much uh, array or battery we've got fitted. This is a typical fl flight profile. Uh, so it's not to scale because that billion pile air force can be several weeks or months long. Um, but the launch and landing phases are typically performed in segregated airspace. So uh, for the missions that you saw just now uh, from the desert there in Yuma, um, the Yuma Proving Ground is actually a, uh, a military test range where um, We've got uh, airspace all the way up uh, as high as we like. Um, it also means that when we're doing our testing, we can drop down below flight level 600 zero zero, um, because uh, we've got the whole airspace to play with. Um, the climb phase, um, we typically use uh, temporary um, or, or uh, temporary uh, restricted areas to allow us to, to climb. Sometimes they can be zoned because we don't know where the Zephyr is going to be blown by the wind. 
So, uh, and we don't also want to um, reserve massive chunks of airspace that uh, other air, uh, airspace users might need. So, um, typically they're broken down into sort of quarters and we um, liaise with the air traffic controllers to which um, sector we need. When we're in the cruise, as I mentioned before, our aim is to stay above uh, the manned aircraft, so uh, above flight level 600. Um, there are certain parts of the world where that, um, that uh, flight level uh, can be lower, um, but uh, yeah, generally we uh, try to stay above that. And uh, coming into land is pretty much the reverse of the taking off in terms of the airspace. This is a, an overlay of Zephyr 8's altitude performance in comparison to Zephyr 7. So Zephyr 7 is the blue line here. Um, so already quite impressive at 14 days, but the, seven, or the 25 day flight that you see for Zephyr 8 um, also shows persistent flight in the stratosphere. So we were maintaining our altitude above flight level 600 um, for the first time, which the Zephyr 8 was able to achieve and the Zephyr 7 couldn't. So I, I'm, I know that, um, well, this, this was before my time, but I know that uh, this was a particular um, proud achievement of the guys who uh, worked on the, the, the Zephyr 7 and the Zephyr 8 at the time. a video. OK, um, so the ground control station that we saw some pictures of earlier, uh, it's basically a glorified ISO container. Uh, so, and the sort that you see on on on, crew, uh, on, uh, on cargo ships. Um, so I've spent many a happy hour inside these things, uh, both flying the Zephyr and uh, testing it on the ground. But the uh, the layout is that we have three stations there. So uh, we have on the left hand, we have uh, uh, an operator station. In the centre, we have the mission plan station. And then on the right hand, we have what is nominally a backup operator station. Um, but as we uh, further explore the capabilities of uh, ZEF and as we convince regulators, um, we will uh, be able to open up the capabilities of the system to uh, to um, fly multiple aircraft um, at the same time. But at the moment, it's uh, more of a, a backup than a, um, a second station. Oh, and there's a photo of the real thing. Um, so I don't know if you can see on the mission uh, the station there in the centre, there is, um, can you see my mouse on the screen? Yeah, so that's um, display there is of particular importance to the mission planners. So this is uh, part of our bespoke software, which um, not only looks at the weather in terms of uh, um, wind speed and, uh, and cloud, but it also calculates a, a, a metric which is important for us, which we call the freedom of movement. So it's mainly based on wind, but it, it also takes in factors uh, such as the uh, the pressure and the maximum RPM that our um, propellers can perform at various altitudes uh, to give us a metric as to how far off course we would would be blown if we were to fly at a certain altitude. So um, that allows us to be able to select windows of launching and landing. Uh, but it also means that um, as part of our ongoing mission planning job, we need to know what happens to that aircraft if there's a failure. If, if, if that uh, aircraft were to lose power and descend, um, where would it go? Because as it comes down through the atmosphere, it's going to get blown around in all sorts of different direction, directions. So um, we uh, are able to calculate um, the point on the surface where the aircraft would come down if we were to have a, a, a failure with the motors. And um, that's a bit of a headache for the regulators because if a manned aircraft, it's quite easy. You just say, don't overfly a populated area. Well, for us, sometimes it's absolutely fine for us to be over a populated area because if we were to have a problem, we would come down maybe two or 300 kilometers away uh, and vice versa. So, you know, so we could be in the middle of the desert flying around but our splat point, as we call it, could be in the middle of the city. So that, these are one of the 
uh, one of the, um, the the conversations that we have to have with the regulator. This just shows the means of control um, that we have once the zephyr's in the air and uh, away from the, the the ground control station. So um, this uh, drawing you see here of the the ground control station has these yellow um, links to an aircraft which is in line of sight. But as we move away from the ground control station, we operate the aircraft via satellite communication. So that is uh, our beyond radio line of sight uh, solution. So um, to, at the moment, we are the only fixed wing hubs to have uh, proven this day and night longevity um, and this persistent operation in the stratosphere. A few other um, perhaps companies and uh, projects sometimes pop up with the headline to say that they've managed to get into the stratosphere or they've managed to fly uh, for, for 24 hours, but um, they, they, they haven't got the persistent uh, capability that we have. We've produced 10 aircraft so far and there's more in the pipeline as part of our ramping up. Um, and we've got our state of the art R&D production facility right here in Farnborough. So this was last year's flight. So um, with each flight and with each generation of Zephyr, we're trying to do something new and, and, and something uh, we didn't do before. Um, so whereas on the 2021 flight, we made our first tentative steps outside of uh, the uh, military test range into controlled airspace. Last year, we, we smashed that. We not only went outside of the, um, uh, the range into controlled airspace, but we also flew all the way down to Belize from Arizona in America. So uh, we were operating from two remote uh, ground control stations. And um, yes, we were having to negotiate with their traffic uh, to allow traffic to pass underneath us. Now this was uh, significant because previously we didn't have anything below us because of the way that we were flying segregated. That's a map of the route that we took. So um, we did spend most of our time doing testing um, in the range here in Arizona, but the route took us all the way across uh, Texas here, out across the Gulf of Mexico, and we conducted some simulated operations down here in Belize for um, uh, a customer. And um, yes, they were very happy with the um, imagery that we were able to collect. Okay, um, that's kind of a, uh, a summary of the of the history that I've already covered. So how do you safely operate an air system? So this is one of the biggest problems we have is um, convincing the regulator that we know what we're doing and we what we're doing and we're doing safely. Um, so much of manned aviation regulations is baked into the fact that um, a loss of an aircraft is automatically a catastrophe. So, um, which, which is true for the most part in, in manned aviation. But uh, two Boeing 747s crashing into each other would be a complete catastrophe. But two Zephyrs crashing into each other over the middle of the Pacific Ocean is not a catastrophe in the, in the manned aircraft stents. It's a big uh, hit to the balance sheet of uh, Alto. Uh, so that's why we don't want to do it but it's not a safety concern in the same sense as uh, two manned aircraft. So we're often having to make um, uh, propositions and, and justifications it's similar to the, the cut down uh, vector that I mentioned just now where overflying um, populations is not necessarily unsafe. Um, but we're having to do this bit by bit and we're, we're having to um, uh, build on the proven um, capability that we had before. So the way that we um, operate the crew is that we have to have, uh, at the moment we, we have at least two uh, person, or a two person crew flying the, the aircraft on um, a shift of eight hours. Uh, what we're trying to do and what we're trying to convince the regulators going forward is to allow us to fly more aircraft per operator. So again, in the manned aviation uh, world, it's normal to think of one aircraft having multiple operators. So uh, uh, an airliner will have two pilots. Uh, in the old, uh, older days, 
uh, flight engineer as well, so three crew. Then for a longer flight, you might think that they are uh, a standby crew um, or a relief crew or a crew having rest while the others are flying. So it's normal to think of one aircraft having multiple crew. We're trying to put the ratio the other way, uh, such that um, we, we want to be able to prove that it's uh, feasible and safe for, um, let's say, one, air, one operator to operate four aircraft at the same time. Um, we're not there yet, but we're, th this is what we're building towards. Uh, so um, the team that we had last year, um, in, in order to account for the, the, the shift rotor and uh, uh, sleep and rest and uh, duty patterns and, and illness and that sort of thing, uh, we had 26 operators and mission planners, uh, three flight test engineers, 10 engineers and maintenance staff on site, um, also with support back here in Farnborough as well, uh, and three meteorologists. So um, the, the challenge that we had with that big long flight is, of course, it's going across so many different areas of weather. Um, when we're just um, flying around in one area, then um, we only need one meteorologist, but um, we need multiple when we're crossing a, a big area. Uh, how do we train the crew? So um, this is a strange situation for um, in comparison to manned aviation, because the first thing you do when you're a, a private pilot or learning to fly a plane, you learn how to take off and land. Well, um, uh, as, uh, as I said in the intro there, I've uh, got 88 hours flying the Zephyr. I've never landed a Zephyr. I've never taken off a Zephyr. I've just been flying in the cruise. Um, but that's because uh, for a typical Zephyr flight, uh, the launch and the landing are rare events. Um, so typically we don't teach launch and landing uh, to our new recruits, um, but they go through a, um, a structured uh, course um, with classroom training, simulator based training, and also um, access to previous flight data as well, which is quite useful to learn. Um, we have a separate qualification for the operators um, and a separate qualification for the mission planners because uh, they are quite different skills. Um, so the engineering uh, skills that we need to uh, operate this effort at the moment are um, uh, the, the, it's not quite as automated as we want it to be. That's one of our future challenges. So at the moment, it's still uh, quite an engineering R&D platform. Um, and with the Mission Planner Academy, uh, we are training to um, look at uh, the weather patterns and uh, how to use our bespoke software. So this is a quote from uh, Chris Kelleher. Um, so we we have this quote printed up uh, uh, on plaques around uh, the um, the facility. So engineering the Zephyr, um, the the aircraft itself on paper isn't different to many uh, manned aircraft or other unmanned aircraft. It is an airframe. It's got um, port and starboard wing, fuselage, tip, uh, tail section. Two motors and propellers, uh, flight control system, uh, controlling a rudder and elevator. We don't have any anons, and our payload is usually in a pod on the nose. So, in that sense, there's nothing too unusual about it. But we do have this solar array battery system. So the, the Zephyr is a flying power station. Um, we have the the solar array on the wings. We have the batteries uh, again um, distributed along the, the wings in a span loaded way. We don't have any undercarriage uh, because that's just dead weight for us. Uh, as you saw on the videos, it comes into land directly on the runway on um, some smooth skids, which are um, on the underside of the wings. Everything that goes on to the Zephyr has to pay its way in terms of power and weight. So this is um, quite often really surprising for people who uh, come in from other parts of manned aviation who think maybe that they're uh, working with low size weight and power equipment. No, we really need our stuff to be absolutely on on the bottom of um, uh, the most minimum size weight and power that we can. You know, we are removing uh, unused connectors from PCBs and unused components. Um, the wiring has to be as thin as possible and we only shield the wiring if we absolutely have to. Every gram has to, has to pay its way. Um, 
going back to the regulation, we sometimes don't fit the the, the regulations for um, unmanned aircraft because uh, a lot of the regulations are quite new and quite immature, and a lot of them are broken down on uh, either mass or um, wingspan. And so it's very unusual for us to be a 75 kilo aircraft, which is sort of a medium weight, but with a 25 meter wingspan, which puts us in a large category. So uh, again, we have to have some conversations with the um, regulators about that. Uh, the temperature ranges that the aircraft endures are very wide. Uh, so we saw uh, the launches happening in the desert. We have to test for uh, a case where we're at 40 degrees centigrade at uh, atmospheric pressure on the, at the surface, all the way up to the stratosphere and, uh, uh, and or through the drop of pause and into the stratosphere. So um, you can imagine that the electronics, the avionics are subject to a very wide um, temperature range. We have to have high reliability um, and the aerostructure is optimized for flight in the stratosphere. So again, it makes it very vulnerable um, when it's coming up through the weather. Uh, we have our ground control station I've just mentioned. We also have some uh, mobile ground terminals uh, to allow us to talk to the aircraft in the hangar. Um, we've got facilities for the batteries as well. So these batteries, uh, the battery engineers tells me that these the batteries are like fresh fruit. They're very delicate. They have to be kept and stored in a perfect uh, environment. If you just leave them on a shelf for two weeks, then they'll spoil. Uh, they have to be nurtured, so we we have um, uh, we have uh, special facilities to to look after it and store our batteries safely. Uh, flight crew simulators um, and various test benches uh, on the ground. So the aero structure is carbon fiber, which is probably no surprise. Um, this test that you see here is called a whiffle tree test. So this um, instead of just bending one end of the wing, we have to um, put a point load all the way along. Um, but again, it's, it's very, very traditional. I mean, this is sort of, um, you know, I guess the Wright brothers would recognize some of the um, uh, the, the, the structure here. Uh, so the, the central spire is a tube uh, with lattice ribs and the skin is a transparent uh, substance called mylar, which is um, uh, uh, shrunk with heat uh, to, to make it taut. Um, we use a substance called Roacel, which is like a very light foam. Uh, for some of our mouldings and also to insulate our electronics. Um, and yes, then the whole thing comes to pieces uh, to uh, store in a, um, or to transport in an ISO container. So one of the things we're looking at uh, in the future when we are making these things at scale and also um, uh, launching from various um, uh, locations around the world is the ability to have something more like a production line uh, for, for manned aircraft where the aircraft leave the hangar and then they are launched uh, at the site that they've been built, which would then re remove the um, requirement for us to uh, design for the case where we need to dismantle it. So the avionics, um, again, the in terms of the platform flight control, um, there's nothing uh, unusual. It's um, um, a, 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 a a flight controller, <clears throat> a flight controller with the uh, uh, inertion and navigation system. Um, the the flight controls are limited just to um, rudder and elevator, so we don't have any ailerons. We don't have any um, uh, either lift devices or or drag devices such as spoilers. So it's um it's a bit like a, a you know sort of a um, a, 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 a traditional um, a vintage aircraft in that sense. Um, for the system, we have uh, battery chargers, which also allow us to um, balance the power across the aircraft. So you can imagine you've got all of these um, battery packs. There are lots of uh, cells uh, built into packs. We've got packs all the way along the wings. Um, we need to manage not only the packs, so that the, the cells are equal voltage, but then also uh, we need to measure across the aircraft to make sure that the packs are of uh, the same voltage as well. Otherwise, the, the, the various batteries would be fighting each other and uh, wasting energy. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we've got uh, measure controllers, 
We've got uh, the various data links. Uh, so some are for line of sight control, others are for beyond line of sight with the SATCOM. And we have our payload controller. So that's what's um, uh, bringing in the money. So we need um, uh, to control that. Uh, some of the um, payloads actually use our own telemetry systems to get their data to the ground. Others, the payload is more like a hook in the sky. So uh, I'll just briefly summarise that. So we, um, for our avionics, we have to find the Goldilocks zone between too hot and too cold. So uh, if we design the avionics such that uh, the heaters aren't sufficient, then it's going to get too cold in the stratosphere. But if we design it with too much insulation, it's going to cook on the ground. So we call that process a thermal balance. Uh, and we're able to um, do that testing ourselves with our own um, thermal and vacuum chamber that we have um, here at Farnborough. Um, there are other thermal vacuum chambers that exist, particularly for space companies, but they are, um, uh, we, we found that they don't have the fine control to allow us to test in the stratosphere. Because uh, for a space launch, uh, the, the test chamber will typically go from surface pressure to space in sort of 10 minutes and there's no real fine control. That's what they need to do. But we, we need to test where we're lingering in the stratosphere. So here's that uh, hockey stick profile I mentioned of uh, temperature and altitude. So our various test points start with the um, the, the the desert case in the hot uh, uh, and um, and um, yeah, so, uh, high temperature and uh, low altitude. And then as we come up through the stratosphere, we have that uh, temperature inversion. And there's a picture of uh, some of our avionics in um, one of the wing bays. So you can see it's in the rover cell enclosure, um, which uh, yeah, which has to be sized to keep it uh, just warm enough. So the um, the solar array is very lightweight, it's very expensive as well, and so we have to um, weigh up the um, for each mission for each aircraft uh, how much array we're going to put on uh, because there's a trade-off between the um, uh, the power density and and the area um, it also means that if we if we put lots of array on that also means that we need lots of batteries to take that uh, energy so uh, it's a balance if we if we fill the whole aircraft with battery then we've got no budget left for our payload so um, again that's why you'll see a lot of these efforts um, will not have all of the uh, wing surface completely covered in um, solar array and there's a picture of um, one of my colleagues uh, applying the solar array. So the, the batteries uh, are developed for us um, as a very um, specific state of the art. These are the, the lowest um, power um, density that we can get. Uh, so the the, the, the battery supplier has a roadmap for us which shows that they are um, uh, going to increase their uh, capacity and uh, and um, uh, power density uh, as time goes on. We're going to take advantage of that for our Zephyr performance. Uh, the propulsion system. Um, so we have a large propeller for great efficiency, um, but uh, for testing, uh, we can't actually get the um, RPM testing on the ground with the real propeller because otherwise we would uh, um, uh, basically uh, overload the motors because uh, the the RPM in the in the stratosphere with the very low uh, air density uh, can't be achieved on the ground so we actually have to use a, a wooden propeller for our testing. Um, so the payloads that we use um, our target market is direct to device connectivity so you saw in the video at the very beginning um, the idea is that the um, Zephyr will provide the communications directly to mobile phone. Um, so the, uh, the 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 target market there is uh, dispersed populations, island nations, um, places where it's just not economical to put lots of uh, uh, mobile phone cell towers. But we still have our other um, military and government um, applications and payloads such as Earth observation and uh, surveillance, both uh, for uh, RF monitoring and um, 
visual cameras. So in future, um, we are um, not only um, looking to make the aircraft uh, physically bigger in future generations, but uh, also increase the, increase the capability of the aircraft um, design that we have. So uh, the, the automation is a big piece, uh, especially when we want to be able to convince regulators that uh, we can have operators mo operating multiple aircraft. That they, it, it, would, it would be uh, ideal just to have a big red and green light for each aircraft to say, yes, it's fine or no, it isn't. Um, but at the moment, um, we're still getting there. The, um, there's a lot of telemetry that comes to the ground that has to be analysed on the ground. Um, but as we develop um, our own algorithms uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and analysis for that data, we can start to put that back up onto the aircraft so we don't have to get all that data down to the ground first. Uh, yeah, this is a diagram of our um, Earth observation uh, um, sensor called OPAS. So uh, you can see that it, it, it's got a very wide field of view, which uh, allows um, uh, Earth observation for uh, forest fires and that sort of thing. And this is just to respond to a question also that I had from Peter earlier, which is that how does the Zephyr fit into uh, existing satellite um, services. So um, we're, if you start at the top with the geostationary uh, satellites, they're very expensive and there is a high latency for the speed of light to travel all the way out to the geostationary satellite and come back again. Uh, closer satellites uh, have a better latency, but they're still expensive. Whereas the Zephyr is a lot, uh, a lot cheaper um, and the latency is a lot lower because we're physically closer to the um, uh, to, to the uh, to, to the surface, but we do have that um, satellite capability because we're that high. Although we can also uh, persist uh, in an area and, and monitor something which a satellite can't do because it's constantly moving. And there's a diagram of um, our cell tower in the sky philosophy. And this is what we intend to do. We want to turn the sky black and zephyrs. Uh, so um, this is a representation of our uh, zephyr parks. So where we're a little bit limited on launching and landing opportunities, what we plan to do is to be able to launch these things um, and park them in, uh, in certain uh, points around the globe where we can then um, assign a task to them uh, uh, after they've been launched, so they, they'll be launched without knowing where they're actually going to serve. Uh, and they also act as a pool of spares for aircraft that are uh, have uh, have a problem, and so that they can switch places and continue to provide that service. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for for um, a really terrific uh, presentation. I think we're all wondering. Um, where, where Zephyr was going. We've read about it in the newspaper and we're, we're really grateful that uh, you made the journey from, and you would like to give you this little gift. Thank you very much. Um, perhaps it might be nice to put to be a, a Zephyr in there, but it's actually a Cody yeah, actually, oh, Fantastic. Well, wow. that's amazing. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, I'm flattered. Thank you. Well, I think we can all show our appreciation. Thank you very much.